and welcome again to the National Fair Housing Training Academy's National Fair Housing Forum titled Assistance Animals Are Not Pets, Reasonable Accommodations Related to Support Animals. My name is Kashana Hill, and I am the Executive Director of the Louisiana Fair Housing Action Center, where I lead a team working to end discriminatory housing policies and practices through litigation and policy advocacy, as well as through the provision of fair housing trainings and foreclosure prevention counseling. It is my pleasure that HUD has invited me to serve again as the moderator of today's event. Please note that this forum features information and examples that represent the experiences of the speakers. Today's comments do not necessarily reflect the policies of HUD. Before we get started, let's review some technical tips and instructions regarding today's event. Thanks, Kashana. If any of you do have technical difficulties with audio or video today, we recommend that you first sign out of the webinar and then sign back in. And if you're still having trouble after that, you can request help in the Q&A box located on the Zoom panel section at the bottom of your screen, or you can send an email to NAFTA, that's N-F-H-T-A, at cloudburstgroup.com. We encourage you to ask questions. You can enter your questions at any time by selecting the same Q&A button on the Zoom panel, but please note that due to time constraints, we may not be able to respond to every question today. This webinar is scheduled for two hours and is being recorded. The recording and the transcript will be made available on the NAFTA website on HUD Exchange, along with resources that supplement today's conversation. Back to you, Kashana. Thank you, TJ. As we move on, I'll share the learning objectives for today's forum. Together, we will understand the types of assistance animals, know more about the types of disabilities that benefit from support animals, comprehend the basic tenets of HUD's guidance on assistance animals, recognize when an accommodation request for an assistance animal should be granted, identify violations of fair housing laws related to assistance animals, and describe testing techniques for reasonable accommodation cases. At this time, I'll introduce our panel speakers. I know we're very eager to learn from the experiences of the speakers, and so we'll just get right into today's conversation. You can find more about our speakers' experiences as well as their bios on the forum page of the NAFTA website. We have Janine Warden, Sarah Pratt, and Megan Confer Hammond. Later in the forum, we will move into a question and answer session. So please do submit questions at any time via the Q&A box on your screen. Please note and personal questions will not be addressed. Lastly, please note that this event is being recorded and the materials, including the slide deck and the event recording will be available on the forum page on HUD Exchange soon after the event. For anyone interested, you can find the slide deck already posted on the NAFTA forum page on the HUD Exchange website. With that, I am now going to hand things over to Janine. Thanks, Kashana, and thank you, everybody. It's my pleasure to be able to participate on this panel where we talk about assistance animals and reasonable accommodations. I'm gonna take a minute to tell you who I am and why I might have something of interest to say on this topic. So for the past 25 years, uh, I have been working on issues involving service animals under the Americans with Disabilities Act, assistance animals under the Fair Housing Act, both types of animals under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, I have probably spoken on the topic of service animals and assistance animals more than anyone I have ever met. And I am very willing to share the information I have. And one thing I'm gonna tell you since this is a virtual presentation, instead of my appearing in person at a conference, you do not get the visual effect of my uh, appearing in person. So I'm gonna describe to you that I am visually impaired. I use a service animal. I have a lovely 
a uh, black and tan German shepherd with very long hair, about eight years old. And typically when I do a presentation, uh, she sits down at my feet attentively listening throughout the presentation. So you missed that visual, so sorry guys, but you do get me even if you don't get my service animal in attendance. I'm gonna move now to the next slide relating to the topics I'm gonna talk about. I'm going to breeze through a lot of different topics. Um, it's all covered in my slides and more importantly, it's covered in the HUD guidance that I'm gonna be discussing during my talk today. Here's what I'm gonna talk about assistance animals and applicable laws, uh, what an assistance animal is, the difference between service animals and support animals, how uh, assistance animals support people with disabilities. I'm going to do an overview of HUD's guidance that was issued in uh, 2020 on assistance animals, and hopefully you'll find that very helpful and we'll refer to it um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the types of information that may need to be included in a reasonable accommodation request. And finally, I'm going to briefly address what HUD has said about documentation that comes from the internet. Here goes. Next slide. So uh, HUD receives an enormous number of complaints alleging uh, disability discrimination, including discrimination, uh, relating to the denial of reasonable accommodations. This slide has a table on the right-hand side and the table provides the percentages of complaints relating to individuals with disabilities and in particular assistance animal related complaints for the past several years. The percentages of reasonable accommodation complaints vary uh, significantly over time, starting around about a third of the complaints and going even over 40% of the complaints relating to individuals with disabilities and reasonable accommodations. And in terms of assistance animal complaints, they, uh, they shift uh, from between 15 and 20% of the overall complaints. Needless to say, assistance animal complaints are uh, it's a very significant part of the workload for both HUD and our FIP and FAP partners. And so this is an area uh, we really need to understand very well. Um, it's also an area where housing providers still are not understanding what their obligations are under the Fair Housing Act. So I'm going to talk through uh, a variety of these things. But the first thing I'm gonna start out with is the term assistance animals. So when I'm talking about assistance animals, I'm talking about dogs and other animals that do work, perform tasks, provide assistance or provide therapeutic emotional support for the benefit of individuals with disabilities. It's a broad term. And uh, sometimes you'll hear people uh, call animals protected under the Fair Housing Act service animals. Sometimes you'll hear them called emotional support animals or support animals. I typically re uh, refer to the whole group of animals that are protected under the Fair Housing Act as assistance animals. And um, uh, you'll see why in a little while. Uh, to be very clear, assistance animals are not pets. They play an important uh, point in the lives of individuals with disabilities. And it, depending on the disability, it could be something that is safety uh, related or it could be something that simply makes life meaningful to a person with a disability. So I'm gonna move to the next slide and discuss the laws that uh, are applicable to uh, service animals or assistance animals. So uh, the law that we're all the most familiar with is the Fair Housing Act. And um, one of the things that our HUD guidance did, which I think is very helpful, is talk about all of the types of housing that are covered by the Fair Housing Act. And so these are all of the types of housing that need to make reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities, including individuals who need assistance animals. Some of these types of housing providers may be a little surprised 
a domestic violence shelter, emergency shelter, uh, college or university dormitory, condominium association, cooperative association, uh, and local land use and zoning officials who are also housing providers under the Fair Housing Act because they make determinations relating to where housing can be. So you'll see in the guidance and on my slides, a large list of covered entities, uh, all covered under the Fair Housing Act. And the Fair Housing Act applies if there is or if there is no federal financial assistance. The second law that applies is uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. That is a law that is spending clause uh, legislation, and it applies only to recipients of federal financial assistance. Uh, some of the time uh, you may see a complaint that is against, for example, a HUD assisted housing provider, and it's brought under both the Fair Housing Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Uh, just so you know, uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act in some disability cases provides broader protection. So you never want to assume if there's an, a subsidized or assisted housing provider involved that the Fair Housing Act is the whole answer. There may also be an answer under the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. The third uh, statute at issue when you're talking about service animals or assistance animals in housing is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act applies to public entities, and that would include any type of state or local government entity that uh, has housing as part of its functions, such as a public housing agency, or uh, it could be some type of a housing and services provider for individuals with disabilities. It could be a homeless shelter, an emergency shelter, you name it. It could be a variety of things that are covered by Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, note there is coverage under all three statutes likely for a lot of the Title II entities because they receive uh, federal financial assistance from HUD and they're also housing, they're covered by the Fair Housing Act. So there may be violations of three laws at issue, obligations of three laws at issue. Third statute I'm gonna talk about is, uh, the, I'm talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act relates to places of public accommodation. So these are privately for-profit or non-profit uh, entities, and they operate a variety of different types of um, places of business, so to speak, that are open to the public. Uh, Title III of the ADA uh, relates to nonprofit organizations, such as fair housing organizations, um, and it also relates to your retail stores, restaurants, uh, hospitals, um, if it's operated as a private entity, you name it, it's covered by Title III of the ADA. Next slide. Um, so on the next slide, we have uh, a lovely picture of a pyramid. And um, uh, I don't have a lot of pictures in my slides, but uh, the pyramid is divided into three sections. The top section is uh, says ADA service animal and it has a dog there. And the reason it has a dog there is uh, service animals under the ADA really only include dogs. Uh, the next uh, category uh, down the line uh, is a category of animals that are trained but are not dogs and um, they also may get protection. They definitely get protection under the Fair Housing Act. If they're miniature horses, they get protection under the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act too, in some circumstances. But uh, there are a lot of animals that may not qualify as um, 
as service animals, uh, but they do actually perform a task. And so one example I'm gonna give you is the capuchin monkey, uh, which has been trained to assist people with quadriplegia be able to live independently in their home. And so if someone does not have the ability to have a caretaker with them or an assistant at any point in time or a family member or friend to assist them, the capuchin monkey can be trained to um, do a lot of the tasks that a person may need assistance with, such as uh, obtaining uh, food, obtaining uh, water and placing it, uh, placing the straw in a person's mouth so they can take a drink if they have a quadriplegia, um, uh, retrieving the potato chips from the cabinet if uh, someone wants a snack, opening the refrigerator, retrieving a bottle, opening a bottle, um, uh, you know, calling 911 if the person is having an emergency and needs assistance or calling a family friend to summon them over. There are all kinds of things that uh, trained assistance animals can do. They still don't qualify as service animals under the Americans with Disabilities Act though. And the, then finally at the bottom of the pyramid on my uh, slide is a category of other assistance animals. And uh, this category of animals includes untrained animals. And there are many types of untrained animals, not only dogs, monkeys, or miniature horses that can provide assistance to people with uh, disabilities in their homes. Um, and there are many, uh, some of the assistance is, um, uh, emotional assistance, it can be assistance in alleviating pain. There are just many, many things that animals nowadays can assist people to do. And with um, everyone uh, recently spending a lot of time because of the pandemic in their homes with their own animals, I think many people have come to a much better recognition of the role that animals play in regulating people's emotions and keeping people from becoming depressed when they are isolated, as sometimes people with disabilities are. Next slide. Uh, the next slide is the uh, definition of what a service animal is. Um, and uh, this comes out of the Department of Justice regulations for Title II and Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And their definition says that a service animal is any dog that is individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of an individual with a disability. And the definition lists all kinds of tasks that um, service animals can perform, including um, there are service animals that are trained to perform tasks for people with psychiatric disabilities. And more and more, there are service animals that are specifically trained to assist veterans in dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome that has been caused by a combat situation. And a lot of the um, uh, service dogs that assist with uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome are nowadays trained by the same schools that train guide dogs for people who are blind. Uh, so it's typically a, a quite a high level of training that's provided. Um, the key things in the definition of service animal is that the animal must be a dog, the animal must be individually trained, and the, there must be at least one task that can be identified that assists a person uh, with a disability. Um, and the regulation that the Department of Justice uh, issued says specifically that emotional uh, support, companionship, well being, those are not tasks for purposes of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So if you hear someone saying, well, a comfort animal, that's not a service animal. What that means is they've been listening to people talk about the ADA and those folks need to be reminded that when you're talking about housing, the category of animals that's covered is a lot broader. Um, and the next uh, slide 
uh, that I am on now emphasizes that there must be work or tasks performed. And um, it uh, lists various type of work or tasks and the relationship between the worker task and the person's disability. Next slide. Uh, next, we're going to talk about support animals. And so when we issued our guidance in um, 2020, uh, we decided to use a broad term support animals really to refer to animals that are not uh, trained to perform tasks. They provide a variety of support uh, and assistance. Um, uh, they may do work. Uh, they um, uh, may perform tasks such as serving as a balance for a person with a physical disability. Typically, that would be a dog. Or it may be uh, simply an animal such as a cat or another type of animal that really provides comfort, well-being, gives the person a purpose to live. There are all different types of things that support animals do uh, that may not be apparent to the um, typical observer, the housing provider who is an observer. So the housing provider may think, oh, this is a pet. It, it looks like any other animal. Um, but the key to it not being a pet is that it actually helps a person with a disability. Uh, and on the next slide, there is a list of a wide variety of ways in which support animals assist people with disabilities. I have seen um, many, many different instances. Uh, support animals are more and more uh, being of assistance to uh, individuals with um, intellectual disabilities or cognitive disabilities or autism, including children. I have seen um, dogs serving as a support animal for a child with autism who helps the parent um, keep, keep the child safer by uh, assisting the parent and keeping the uh, child from darting out into the street or becoming separated from the parent. Uh, there are uh, assistance animals that remind people to take medication and really just a broad array of uh, support animals that help people cope with the circumstances of their um, psychiatric disabilities or physical disabilities. And um, it, it makes life more livable for those people. And in some instance, the bond between the support animal and the individual with a disability is so strong that if you take that support animal away, the person no longer has a reason to live. And I have definitely met people who have that type of a really strong bond with their support animals. Uh, so the next slide discusses uh, various types of reasonable accommodations. The most common ones we see are exceptions to no pet rules exceptions to charging fees, exceptions to breed restrictions. Um, uh, if there is a rule that applies to a pet, it doesn't apply to an assistance animal. So if there is a weight limitation on the type of dog that a person can have for a pet, that weight limitation would not apply to an assistance animal that is a dog. And in fact, um, most of the service animals that um, that actually do work or perform tasks for blind people and people with physical disabilities do tend to be the larger dogs that would exceed the weight limitation that most housing providers would impose. So, it, you know, there also cannot be a fee for even requesting a reasonable accommodation. I recently heard that some housing providers try to do that. That would be a violation of the Fair Housing Act. So I'm moving on to the next slide uh, where I want to discuss the FHEO notice that was issued in 2020. It was the first notice of that year. Um, and what HUD was trying to do in that notice was make the issue of assistance animals a lot easier 
for housing providers to understand uh, and help them get a much better understanding of the limited amount of information they need to make a decision. And then also to help healthcare providers understand the type of information they may need to provide to support the reasonable accommodation request of an individual with a disability. And the documents are really written in very practical uh, question and answer form. Uh, the first document is a step-by-step -step analysis that a housing provider can use to figure out if it's an animal for which a reasonable accommodation needs to be granted. It starts with questions about service animals, since under the Americans with Disabilities Act, there are very limited questions that can be asked. Uh, um, really, uh, is this a service animal that assists you because of a disability? And what work or tasks has the animal been trained to perform? As long as the individual answers that the animal is trained to assist them because of a disability, it's a dog, and they identify one task it's been trained to perform, that's the point where the housing provider shouldn't be asking anything additional. Uh, it is determined to qualify as a service animal under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and all animals that qualify as service animals under the Americans with Disabilities Act are also covered by the Fair Housing Act. Um, the second section of the uh, guidance that uh, HUD issued talks about reasonable accommodations, and it really goes to the question of whether a person has uh, requested a reasonable accommodation or not. It answers some very important questions relating to reasonable accommodations, like do you have to request the reasonable accommodation before you get the animal? And the answer is no. Um, in some instances, while I think it's best to ask the question before getting the animal, the person may not even realize there's a pet restriction in the housing, and they may not even be aware they're in violation of their housing provider's rule or they have caused some problems with their housing provider until the housing provider tries to evict them. So we made clear in the guidance that uh, reasonable accommodations can be requested at any time, including when the person is in the middle of an eviction process because of the presence of an assistance animal. Uh, the, the next piece uh, of the document talks about uh, the relationship between the animal and the disability. And it really goes to the issue of whether there is a disability related need for an animal. There are only a couple of questions that uh, can be asked in that context. One is to establish whether the person has a, a physical or a mental impairment. The second is whether the person's impairment substantially limits a major life activity. And the third is um, whether uh, there is some disability related need for assistance or therapeutic emotional support provided by the animal. Um, this is, uh, it, it's really intended, the guidance, if you read it, is really intended to walk a person through every step of the decision-making process. And it talks about uh, some of the sticky situations as well. Can a person have more than one assistance animal? Uh, well, that's a case-by-case -case analysis. Uh, there will be some circumstances where it's appropriate for a person to have more than one assistance animal. I'll give you an example. Let's say a person has been uh, using a service animal. The service animal is retired. Um, they need to get a new service animal because the former service animal can't perform anymore. Uh, there would be a disability related need to keep both of them because of the emotional attachment that the person has to the first animal. They need to do the transition and then they need a new service animal to assist them. There could also be more than one person in the household who needs um, an assistance animal. So they may each need their own assistance animal. And so that could increase the number of assistance animals that are needed. 
The real question is whether there is a need for each of the individual animals for which a reasonable accommodation is being requested. Just checking on time, I don't want to take up uh, too much of um, Sarah's Thanks for asking, Janine. We're right at about time. I know you do still have several more slides, so um, please do with that information what you will. I do also want to let you know that we have two very quick follow-up questions that I think we should address before we move on to the next panelist, because uh, it seems some of our attendees have some questions about specific terms and languages that, and language that you've used, and I'd like to clear that up before we move on to the next panelist so that we're all operating with the proper knowledge base. Thanks, of course. Should I ask those follow-up questions now or would you like to proceed? I'm happy to I'm happy to take them later, but I will just say that uh, the second part of the guidance is guidance for healthcare uh, professionals and it lists the very limited types of information that are really needed. Uh, those types of information are put on the slides. It's really basically does the person have a disability? and a disability related need for the animal. There's no need for medical records or special types of examinations. Um, and uh, there is a, a specific notice that where uh, if the uh, healthcare provider used that as a guide, they would provide enough information for the person to have their reasonable accommodation requests granted. Um, there's another slide that says uh, limits on requesting information. So here's an important rule. If uh, a person has a disability that is obvious or known to the housing provider, they don't need to ask for any information. They only need to ask for information if a person has a non-obvious disability and the disability-related need is non-obvious. Can't be observed. And uh, the last point I'd like to touch really briefly is documentation from the internet. The uh, guidance that HUD issued has um, uh, a specific statement about uh, the extent to which that uh, guidance can and cannot be relied upon. Some uh, documentation obtained over the internet is from a valid healthcare provider. Uh, and if there's a treating relationship and a valid healthcare provider involved, uh, that is reliable information. There's personal knowledge involved. Uh, some uh, certificates obtained over the internet are uh, dispensed if you pay a fee and answer four or five questions. Uh, that does not involve a relationship with a treating professional, a healthcare treating professional. And um, I am sorry, but I believe that people with disabilities who purchase those types of uh, certificates are getting scammed. They are not worth the paper they're printed on. And Kashana, I'll turn it back to you at this point. Thank you, Janine. So just quickly to go over the um, questions about language, there were several attendees who wrote in with the same question, which is, um, if you could just quickly explain, please, what individually trained means, what that language and what that requirement means. So an animal is individually trained if the animal is trained uh, to perform an action in response to a circumstance. So the, there is specific language in my slides that explains it uh, more specifically, but for example, uh, if you have a veteran with post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, the animal that is trained to work with that individual will be very attuned to the individual. For example, they'll, the animal will be able to understand if the person is about to have a panic attack, it will move closer to the person to give them physical contact to orient them to reality. That is a sufficient task to meet the individual training requirement. Thanks, Janine. Um, and then the additional clarifying question, and Sarah did help us with an answer, but I just wanna make sure that people are clear on this because it comes up a lot. You had mentioned in your presentation that ADA service animals are generally just dogs. And the clarification we received from Sarah, because there was a question asking about are dogs the only animals that qualify as service animals 
animals under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And Sarah clarified for us in the Q&A box that service animals under the ADA are limited to dogs and in some cases, miniature horses. The ADA does not protect the use of other kinds of animals as service animals, but the Fair Housing Act does. And I just wanted to see if there was any further clarity you wanted to add there. So it's interesting. Um, the folks over at the Department of Justice, when they define service animal, they actually call a service animal a dog. That said, they do allow reasonable accommodations for miniature horses, even though they don't consider them service animals. But there are specific limitations. For example, if a miniature horse couldn't be accommodated in, um, in a concert hall because the seating was so close together that the horse would not be able to uh, be out of the way of um, other patrons or uh, block access to an exit, uh, there might be the ability to withhold the ability to have a miniature horse in that context. But Sarah is absolutely correct. There can be all different kinds of animals protected by the Fair Housing Act, not the ADA though. Thank you so much, Janine. Um, and as has been posted in the chat, we will get into these issues um, in more detail with the following uh, presentations. So we will now move on to our next panelist who I know is so eager to jump in. Just a reminder to everyone that you can keep submitting your questions via the Q&A box. And also the slides for today's event are already up on the forum page of the HUD exchange. And there is a link to that page in the chat if you'd like to access the slides. So with that, we are going to hear from Sarah Pratt, who will discuss when reasonable accommodations should be made, obvious and non-obvious needs for accommodation, breed and weight requirements, defenses in support animal cases, and when denials or delays may violate the Fair Housing Act. Sarah. Sarah, you, you're still on mute. We can't quite hear you yet. Here we go. Sorry about that. There you go. I'm delighted also to be here today. I'm going to pick up on some of the points that Janine made and amplify them a little bit uh, and also give you some contextual information about some of the ways that um, people think about reasonable accommodations for assistance animals and some of the ways that courts have said this is not a defense so that you know if you try something, courts have already said, no, that's not going to work. So as we think about reasonable accommodations, the first thing we think about, yes, it's the Fair Housing Act and, it, and the Fair Housing Act protects, it is the Fair Housing Act that applies to housing. And you can say, oh yes, ADA Title III applies too, but generally speaking, when we're talking about residents of housing, it's the Fair Housing Act. Put aside, you're thinking about the ADA, it's the Fair Housing Act. And the guidance that Janine refers to, she, she uh, did not uh, note that her name is on it. She is the expert on that guidance. And it is a, 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 you know, a very thoroughgoing analysis about this. What I'm gonna do is take out some of the points uh, that are, and try to give you some additional thoughts on them. So discrimination under the Fair Housing Act includes discrimination against a buyer or a renter, or also somebody who's associated with them like a visitor. And that does come up, somebody says, oh, I've got a visitor, he's got a disability, he's gonna bring his assistance animal, is that okay? Protection applies under the Fair Housing Act to that kind of setting. Um, as uh, Janine also pointed out, the kinds of housing, which this reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act applies, uh, my colleague uh, Megan is gonna talk a little bit later about the way the, this process works uh, in, in universities, for example, and the Department of Justice in, uh, litigated several years ago, major lawsuit against a, a university over a reasonable accommodation assistance animal setting and the law on this is well established, mobile home parks, dormitories, all the rest of them, farm worker housing, all covered dwellings under the Fair Housing Act, reasonable accommodation applies. So you look for the pin to housing to apply the Fair Housing Act, that seems self-evident, but if I hear one more person says, when I talk about an apartment complex, well, oh, the ADA. I don't wanna hear about the ADA if we're talking about the uh, housing, okay? Just don't. Um, so 
De definition of disability, I'm really not going to spend a lot of time on this. The definition of disability is pretty much the same, whether you're talking about the ADA, the Fair Housing Act, uh, Section 504, and it's a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of their life, life's daily activities. And the question is, is there an impairment? Does it substantially limit one or more of life's daily activities? Also, the act covers people who are people who are regarding as have regarded as having such an impairment. So they're not disabled in that way today, but they're treated that way uh, because perhaps because of stereotypical thinking or um, uh, outright hostility to someone with a disability. We certainly seen, certainly seen hate crimes against someone who was uh, perceived to be disabled. And finally, the Fair Housing Act covers people who have an, a record of such an impairment, who again are not impaired in their daily activities today, but have a record of being impaired in that way in the past. So I'm going to skim through the slides on this. You can see some of those things from the regulations that talk about uh, what, what it means to be um, regarded as impaired or having a record of an impairment. But that's not really what you want to talk about today. I think you want to talk about, you know, sort of how, the, how it works in real time. I do want to point out that the Fair Housing Act doesn't protect a person with an individual who, whose tenancy would constitute a direct threat to the health or safety of others or result in substantial physical damage. People come up with these, these, this, these things in cases and they say, oh, we can't permit this dog, whatever the dog is, because it's a direct threat. Well, let me just say that some saying something is some animal would be a direct threat is not the same thing as that animal being a direct threat. And all of those entities that try to establish breed restrictions try to justify them on some direct threat analysis. But the Fair Housing Act does not accept the broad-based threat analysis. It has to be quite specific. It has to be a quite specific and demonstrated threat. More importantly, you're not allowed to rely on um, assumptions or stereotypes or fears or anxieties, or even a fear that someone will hurt themselves or hurt someone else just because they have a disability or because use an assistance animal. So um, the direct threat provision of the Fair Housing Act is rarely used with respect to the use of assistance animals. So there's really only five things if you're a landlord that you have to think about. Does the person have a disability within the meaning of the law, right? And in a minute, we'll talk about uh, Janine's point a little bit more obvious versus non-obvious. Does the housing provider know that the person has a disability? If it's obvious, they know. If they, it's not obvious, they may or may not know. Is the accommodation needed for the individual to use and enjoy the housing? That is, this, essentially, is it needed with some connection to the housing? Right? Is there something connected to the housing about the use of the animal? Janine, you can bite back at me on that later if you want to. Does the housing provider know that? And, and then was the accommodation delayed, denied, conditioned by charging a fee for it? This is the whole thing about, no, you can't charge a fee to apply for a reasonable accommodation. You can't charge a fee for a deposit for a pet. You cannot charge a fee for um, uh, uh, having, having, a, having dog insurance. You cannot have, you know, you could not require that the dog be spayed or require some other imposition of a condition on the needed accommodation. And that uh, uh, um, objection to conditioning a reasonable accommodation is rather broad. So how do you talk to someone about having a disability? I would say that um, this would go for investigators, for people who work with fair housing groups and with landlords. You do not get to ask for a diagnosis. You do not ask what's wrong with the person and you do not request a doctor's statement. Let's be real. All of those, those ideas are, operate based on stereotypes, um, based on the fact that maybe somebody has a diagnosis, but that doesn't tell you anything. And actually it's an illegal inquiry into the nature of the severity of the disability. Uh, you cannot request a doctor's statement and HUD, and we are all grateful for this, HUD has made it really clear that the situation in which um, uh, uh, disability is established or reasonable accommodation can be established can be done in many ways and be perfectly lawful and not objectionable. And this, when I say this, I speak to landlords who say, no matter who you are or what you're, what you're asking for, I must have a doctor's statement signed under penalty of perjury. 
you are setting yourself up for a fair housing complaint or a lawsuit when you do that. So landlords, think again about these paperwork forms that require a doctor to sign it, require that it be signed under penalty of perjury, and require that they say that the person has the disability and name the disability. Any of those kinds of inquiries were unlawful. So if you're talking to someone about this, what do you say? Well, how does your disability affect your life? How, how, how long has it affected your activities? How does it affect your ability? How do people perceive you if a person is not obviously dis disabled? I'll tell you that if you're a HUD investigator or investigator for some state or local agency, someone is gonna ask you about this question. And the best way to ask about it, because they're gonna think about how they would prove it in court. And so I would say that if you're interviewing someone or trying to establish whether or not someone has a disability within the meaning of the Fair Housing Act, the kinds of questions you ask are open-ended questions. The person with the disability will offer them as, appro as appropriate to them and they will talk about, and they will have to, at some point, have some discussion about their disability and the need for the accommodation. Janine, I know you gave a slightly different answer to that question, and I, I can't because I know that the HUD investigator or the FAP investigator is gonna want more information to back up the questions they will get from the HUD lawyers on. There you go. So you, you have the interview and, and what you're not doing is projecting negativity or demanding anything. You're asking the person open-ended questions and inviting them to give you enough information so you conclude, conclude this is a person with a disability and a person who needs the accommodation. You don't request the diagnosis. You don't request a doctor's statement before you say anything. I always say to this, please come into my office or come into my virtual office and tell me what it is that you need and why you need it. If you just got a reasonable answer to that question, from HUD's point of view, that's enough, right? It's just saying, technically, that's enough. So now we're on the obvious versus not obvious. Okay, generally speaking, HUD says, landlords and other people are generally expected to know that a person is disabled. And if, if, there is, if, if they're obvious, if it's an obvious disability, whether it's a physical disability, like using a walker or walking slowly, or whether it's a mental disability, which can often be detected by conversations with the individual. Um, so if the disability is known, is obvious, then that is no documentation is not as required. And this is, I believe, a reasonable person standard. So if a reasonable person knowing what the landlord knew would have seen that the, known that the person was dis disabled, that's enough. There are some cases where the disability truly is not obvious. Um, and then the next question that HUD says you need to talk about is, is there some other way that the landlord should have known that the disability existed? It can be income related. It can be mentioned previously. It might have been disclosed in course of conversation. The case law says that if the landlord is, if the, if the disability is not obvious, and the landlord doubts that the person has a disability, you have the, it's the landlord's obligation to ask further. And they can engage in a dialogue like, please tell me more. See, I love this because it's like having a conversation with someone. Please tell me more about this. If you're in doubt, don't just go, go saying, oh, please get me a doctor's statement, have it signed under penalty and perjury because that could violate, that would violate the Fair Housing Act. Sit down, please tell me a little bit more about it, or can you give me some more confirmation so I can understand? And the landlord's doubt, doubt in that situation has to be a reasonable doubt, for sure. Um, the documentation, again, HUD says clearly does not have to come from a doctor. It does not have to be sworn to. So here's some examples that HUD gives of documentation that can be uh, evidence of someone having a disability. And, in assisted housing of various types, it's very common for someone to have provided a disability determination, a voucher that someone only gets because they're disabled, like the non-elderly disabled or NED voucher, right? There can be information from a healthcare provider. There can be a person's own statement that they are disabled. There can be SSI or SSDI statements, social security payments, veterans payments, folk rehab, disability benefits from the state or even a local agency, there's a lot of evidence that a landlord would have to accept. 
What HUD says is that a landlord cannot lawfully require a doctor's statement, cannot require that such a statement be notarized or signed under penalty of perjury, and cannot require a diagnosis. That's in red print, so nobody can question or forget that particular point. Because it's, in my, my experience, the most common mistake that landlords make. Now, when I'm talking to a landlord, I say, after you've talked to a person about a disability and what they're asking is an accommodation, I always tell them to use their brain next. Take a minute. Listen, think. Can we gener generally approve this accommodation? The answer should generally be yes. The first response should be yes, not no. And if you're questioning it, any reasonable accommodation, would it cost a boatload of money and would it change things dramatically? This is lay people talk for. Would it be an undue financial and administrative hardship or would it be a fundamental alteration to business operations? Because that's the legal standard for a denial of reasonable accommodation. Investigators, when a respondent gives you 18 reasons why this reasonable accommodation could not, should not have been granted, your screen, and they give many reasons, but your screen is, would it fundamentally alter the business operations or would it be an undue financial and administrative hardship? Don't be distracted by the 18,000 reasons why they won't have to have poop patrol or why they can't have a dog walked in the yard or why the cat will scream when the person leaves the apartment, right? Focus on what would genuinely be an undue financial and administrative hardship or a fundamental alteration. It is not a good reason to turn down a requested accommodation because everybody will want it if you approve it for one person. How many HUD cases did I see where that the, the landlord said that? Well, if I give it to you, I'll have to give it to everybody, so no. It's because someone a long, long, long 100 years ago told them they had to treat everybody equally. In disability discrimination, and particularly in the area of reasonable accommodation, it is not about equal treatment. It is providing the access to the service or opportunity that the person with a disability needs, and it is surmounting whatever the barrier is to let, letting them get access to that opportunity. If a landlord's gonna say no uh, to a requested accommodation, um, they, again, undo financial and administrative hardship, alteration of the program, but if they're going to say no, they suppose they're supposed to move into an interactive process. And an interactive process is not, you can't have what you want for, but here's what I'll give you, which is very typical landlord response. I don't want to do what you want to do. So I'm going to, but I'll do what I want to do. That is not the correct analysis for an interactive process. And investigators, if you hear that, you stop right there and say, well, did you respond to to the requested accommodation. Did you say yes or no to the requested accommodation? They're gonna say, I said no. And then the question is, was there truly, did they have an undue financial and administrative hardship or fundamental alteration of the program that allowed the landlord to say no in the first place? Because if they said no and they didn't have one of those two criteria met, it's not, let's make a deal. It's grant the requested accommodation unless there are really ma major reasons that are financial and administrative or programmatic to keep you from doing it. An interactive process is supposed to be when people talk together about what should be done to solve the question. Imagine. Uh, Janine touched on this, but when can a person request a support animal before rental while a tenant? When the landlord discovers the animal living in the apartment, which they previously did not know about. No, they could not accuse the animal of trespassing, which I've heard. Um, you can request an accommodation even when the landlord is seeking eviction because the animal is being discovered and was there without permission. A request for a reasonable accommodation could be made then. A request for a reasonable accommodation can be made when someone is being visited by a friend or family member who needs an assistance animal. And finally, there does not have to be a special form. We, I tell people, and I've told people for years, I'm sure most uh, advocates would, people rec recommend that you make a written request that you save a copy of via email or by a letter um, because it documents and you date it and you address it and you say what you want, you say why you want it and you sign your name to it and you keep a copy. 
email, letter, whatever it is. Why? Because it documents that you made a written request. And then you have a fight about who said what to when who. So um, uh, for those of you who uh, cannot see, I have some very cute service animals with harnesses on, uh, a beautiful golden, uh, golden uh, retriever and a, uh, and a pit bull mix, maybe with beautiful brown eyes. And let's talk about assistance animals for a second. So bottom line here, uh, reasonable accommodations for common domestic animals. I like this part, Janine, maybe the best of all of the things that the HUD guidance addresses. Landlords may not limit the breed or the size of the dog used as a service or support animal just because of the size of the breed. I love it when you say that. That's my talk because it's real clear. You can't say no Rottweilers. You can't say no pit bulls. You can't say no dogs over 20 pounds. You cannot say those things. A landlord can limit a particular animal because they actually have conduct issues not because of an assumption about the behavior of a particular breed. Now, that's common domesticated animals. If you've got the question, request for an ostrich or a snake, a python. You know, people want to convince me that a python is a normal domesticated animal. I'm not buying it, not, right? So uh, when you are requesting a, a unique animal, HUD says you've got to have a stronger showing that there is a need for that specific uh, kind of animal um, in, in the particular setting as required, that is to say case by case circumstance. So you can't have a rule that says no ostriches ever or no llamas or no donkeys. Okay. Um, there can be some situations where you are um, countering needs between one group of people with an animal and another group of people with an allergy, I would say. And the key that I have to say about that is that is the absolute example for an interactive process that the landlord involves addressing the needs of various parties. Other people may have more things to say about that, but I'm trying to get people to talk to each other and try to accommodate the needs of each other, uh, not, to, um, not to make a decision, a flat decision one way or the other when you're talking about conflicting issues. I have a very cute picture of a very large dog. And let me just say, no weight restrictions. Landlords cannot impose weight restrictions. Landlords, on the other hand, may have something to say about the weight of this particular animal, but that's on the owner of the animal, not on the landlord, to have a comment about this very cute little, uh, I don't know what he is. Would you say a bulldog, maybe? Overweight, for sure. Sarah, I'm so sorry to hop in here. I usually would not do this, but um, since we're we're getting a lot of questions about, could you just quickly address as a follow-up, yeah. what if the county or municipality prohibits a specific breed of dogs while we're talking about- If a county, or municipality, a, if a county or municipality prohibits a certain breed of dog, a complaint can be accepted uh, and taken against the municipality challenging its breed restriction as a denying, effectively denying a reasonable accommodation in this setting. Same process for an insurance company, which allegedly says that the insurance uh, company doesn't cover, won't allow or won't protect the landlord if they accept a Rottweiler or a German Shepherd. At least half the time when those uh, uh, assertions are investigated, it is not true because the insurance company doesn't say anything about service or assistance animals or breeds. But when it is true, then the separate complaint is taken against the insurance company. Thank you so much and forgive me for the interruption. That's okay, happy to do it. Someone else asked this question. Here's a list of defenses that the courts have rejected. I'll go through them quickly in a second, but I do wanna say, before I go into the defenses even more, I wanna say, I wanna emphasize the question about what happens if you have multiple requests for reasonable accommodations for multiple animals. You can't just say no. There is a reasonable accommodation analysis that has to be applied to each animal. Right? And so why, tell me what the name of this dog is. Oh, that's Sparky. Okay. Can you tell, explain to me, does Sparky provide assistance to you? Do you have a disability? You have those questions. That's Sparky. Now you move on to the next one. That's Frankie. So now explain to me about Frankie and how Frankie uh, provides a, assistance or a service to you. Now there's Joe. Now what about that? So you know, that's the reasonable accommodation um, 
analysis. It's fact specific. It's to each animal. The fact that you say you need three is not enough. The fact that you have the same analysis for three is not enough. You have to have a special, a separate reasonable accommodation analysis for each animal. And I'll tell you that fact finders get more and more suspicious after you get to about two or three. So just telling you it might be, and James Janine may agree with this or may not, I know it. And that is a court, a judge, a HUD investigator is gonna get more and more questioning uh, once you get past two animals. That's not to say there couldn't be three or four. I think it's appropriate, for example, to have a dog uh, that is your current assistance animal or service animal and another dog or other animal who is in training to serve the same capacity because the first dog is getting old, for example, and that's too easily. Okay, we have a no, pot policy, no pet policy, not a defense. We don't permit dogs over 40 pounds, not a defense. We don't permit Rottweilers, pit bulls, German shepherds, not a defense. Didn't fill out my form, not a defense. Have to pay a pet deposit, not a defense, and it's not a pet. No deposits for assistance animals. Have to provide a release for the doctor, not a defense. No broad releases, and doesn't have to be from a doctor. Insurance won't permit it. As for the policy, if true, file against the insurance company. Town doesn't permit that repeat that breed. Request an accommodation from the town, and that can be both by the person with the disability and a with a from a cooperative landlord. The landlord can assist in doing that. Right? Where well, the landlord would like to permit the accommodation. And then, but they're both saying to the town, we'd like to have a reasonable accommodation. Okay. So I think uh, that I should, there are probably a million other questions, and I think it's probably time for me to turn this back to Kashana. Here's some examples of three cases where HUD has issued charges. Uh, recently uh, over assistance animal situations. Uh, my favorite one is the landlord said she looked up the rules and the accommodation only replied to people who were blind or deaf, deaf or had another disability. This person had another disability uh, and an emotional disability and a psychiatrist letter and they still down, turned down the accommodation. But I will just say HUD investigators, you should not be acceding to landlords and their doctor statements requirements. And landlords, you should not be requiring a doctor statement anymore. The guidance is clear. You've heard the training. Change your policies and your practices. Back to Kashana. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, we will move on to our final panelists and hopefully um, get to some of these questions. I think this is the most questions that we've had in a very long time. So there's lots to discuss here. Another reminder that all of the slides for today's conversations are available on the forum page of the HUD Exchange. The link has been posted in the chat a couple of times. All of the slides are already available. Anyone interested can find the slides on the forum page of the HUD Exchange. With that, we will move on to our final panelist, Megan Confer Hammond, who will discuss what a support animal case might look like, how to investigate complaints involving reasonable accommodations, and the testing techniques for complaints about a denial request for reasonable accommodations. Megan? Thank you, Kushana. Uh, my name is Megan Confer Hammond. I am the Executive Director of the Fair Housing Partnership of Greater Pittsburgh. Uh, next slide, please. So let's go over what you've been hearing so far is to understand the context of the Fair Housing Act. Understand what laws govern emotional support animals. So you now know that the Americans with Disabilities Act was revised in 2010 that removed emotional support animals and only service animals are permitted in what's called public spaces. Now, what you've seen in the news is most likely for the past few years regarding the Air Carrier Access Act. And so in 2020, the Department of Transportation published a rule that removed the requirement that allowed emotional support animals on airplanes. And so when we get to the Fair Housing Act, and as you've already heard and likely know, is that the Fair Housing Act simultaneously as uh, the Air Carrier Access Act reviewed emotional support animals in 2020. HUD then issued the guidance in 2020 affirming that in our housing, we have the right to the most accessible environment possible and that the Fair Housing Act 
absolutely allows emotional support animals within our own homes. And so when we talk about the Fair Housing Act in our homes, remember the 1988 legislative history in which disability was added as, as a protected class. The disability movement gripped our communities and we pushed for our homes to be an accessible space in which we could be our most secure. So the next slide, please. So let me share that I myself am deaf. You know, my actual hearing loss is severe to profound. And I am wearing the highest powered hearing aids on the market and using other assisted technology to access my computer. I'm raising that because an emotional support animal is a disability assisted device. And a disability assisted device is an extension of the person with the disability. So if my hearing aids squeal with feedback and that bothers those around me, then it's my responsibility to address that malfunction. Similarly, if an emotional support dog barks in a continuous manner that's disrupting other tenants, then the disabled tenant is responsible to address the barking. However, I cannot guarantee that my hearing aids will never squeal. Hearing aids squeal and dogs bark. My responsibility is to address any malfunction of my disability assistive device when it happens, but I cannot be treated differently because a malfunction may happen. And so as we look at what happens uh, is that an emotional support animal is no different than hearing aids or canes or walkers or wheelchair. It's an extension of the disabled individual. Next slide, please. And so what I want to explain is that you understand is that I am the executive director of a fair housing initiative program of death. And for those of us who work directly with complainants, we know that the written law is not easy to apply when we are on the telephone with a tenant a homeowner or a landlord or a co-op board or more. And so I'm gonna spend some time today taking you through the casework that we've done at FHP in conjunction with then filing a complaint at HUD uh, and our fair housing assistance programs. So a few years ago, we received a call from a young woman who had recently moved into her apartment with the, within a large multifamily complex. And she had stated on her online application that she had an emotional support dog she provided a doctor's letter and she moved in. Now, this housing provider operates multifamily housing in several states, uh, as well as Washington, DC, but this was their only rental property in Western Pennsylvania or all of Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. So the young woman contacted us because her landlord was now requiring, after she had moved in, to complete a packet for her emotional support dog to be allowed to remain in the unit. She was really upset at the prospect of providing the detailed information that the packet required, uh, detailed information about her mental health and her treatment. And so if you remember only one thing from this entire panel, I implore you to remember that reasonable accommodations are not about the diagnosis, but they're about the symptoms or the impact of the disability on that person's life. And so at our intake process, we asked this young woman to explain what her mental health symptoms were and how her emotional support dog helped her. And so she talked about having constant feelings of restlessness. She had a hard time concentrating to complete a task such as preparing food and that, dif that disrupted her day-to-day -day schedule. Uh, she worried excessively to the point that she had difficulty sleeping through the night. And so in the course of our intake process, we realized that after she had moved in, that her leasing agent had flagged her because she had been seen walking her emotional support dog. And her dog is a 50 pound pit bull. And as she explained to us what had happened when she had been confronted while walking her dog, we then started to talk to her about how did she come to pick her emotional support animal? How did she come to, to decide to have an emotional support animal? And so she explained to us that she was on psychiatric medication and she didn't want to increase it. And truly with mental health, you can only take so much medication and go to therapy so often. And at 2 a.m. with restless moving about with insomnia, it is the presence of an emotional support animal 
that provides the peace of mind and the calmness to sleep through the night in order to go to classes or go to work or you know, do whatever the next day requires. And she explained with us that she had gone to an animal shelter and had picked her dog, who happens to be a 50 pound pit bull. And the dog provided that feelings of safety and security where she was able to relax in her own home and sleep through the night and function better throughout her day to day. Next slide, please. And so she had contacted us because the certification in me that her landlord had provided was required to be completed in full and that she had to submit that to her landlord in order to keep her emotional support dog in her unit. And she was devastated. And I'm pulling out a couple of the most uh, terrible aspects of the packet that we saw. And there were several aspects of this packet that were problematic. And what we see here in question number seven is a requirement that clearly shows the housing provider's preference for the type of animals used as an emotional support animal. And so this is steering, for lack of a better word for it, to see how this packet is trying to force or prefer that the tenant have a fish, hamster, bird, or a similar caged or contained small pet. If not that, then a cat. And then if not a cat, then a dog, but a dog no larger than 30 pounds with restricted breeds. And what became immediately apparent to her is that her emotional support animal was restricted or denied by this packet. And then further, when the packet looks into the totality of her treatment, how else is her mental health treated? It's asking for detailed information about any way that she receives treatment, whether it's psychiatric care, talk therapy, medication, uh, or any ongoing treatment. And so consider that when I make a reasonable accommodation request about my deafness, that a landlord cannot not ask me why I'm using hearing aids or instead of a cochlear implant, or I cannot be asked why I'm using American Sign Language instead of cute speech. It's the same thing. And so for this young woman, she was devastated at the concepts that she was clearly going to be denied her emotional support dog in this unit. And she was asking us what she could do. Next slide, please. And further, uh, to speak to what you just heard from Sarah, is that the packet also required it was signed under the pains and penalties of perjury. And then the requirement that the third party verifier be a licensed medical professional was further substantiated in the signature page that required the third party verifier to verify that they are in fact a licensed medical professional. And so go back to 1988 and what we went through as a disabled community to get the laws that are on our books today, to remember that the Fair Housing Act is a deliberately broad definition of disability to give us accessibility within our own home. Access to professional mental health services is not easy to get and it's not available to everyone. Consider whether this young woman had, instead of seeing a psychiatrist, that she had a case manager through a social service agency or a center for independent living. Next slide, please. And so our response to this young woman's complaint at FHP was twofold. First, we established her prima facie complaint, her standing as a person with a disability who required an emotional support animal and her need for that animal and that it was being denied. And then we realized because of the size of the housing provider, not simply the size, but the packet and the policy that she'd been given, that we needed to determine what that housing provider's practice or policy was. Is this packet required of everyone, for example, who requests an emotional support animal? Or was it only required of people who had a breed or an animal type that was restricted? So we conducted a fair housing testing investigation. At FHP, our testers reports are written narratives because we are in Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania is a two-party consent state. Each test that we did was structured as a matched pair test with the protected and a control tester. And so for the protected tester, recognize that a reasonable accommodation does not have to use the words reasonable accommodation. And so a protected tester is making a statement of disability, is stating if the tester doesn't have a disability themselves and perhaps on behalf of a spouse or a child in the household, 
that my spouse has a disability that causes insomnia and they have difficulty sleeping through the night. And so they require an emotional support though. That in and of itself is a reasonable accommodation. A protected tester made that request and the control tester inquired into the pet policy. This allowed us to evaluate whether or not the emotional support animal policy differentiated from the pet policy at the complex. In total, we did three match pair tests. In each test, our protected tester was given the emotional support animal packet. That packet was then provided to FHP and we filed a complaint at HUD on behalf of both the young woman uh, and FHP organization. Next slide, please. And so the settlement ultimately resulted in an amended reasonable accommodation packet. And in fact, the amendments showed that the packet that required that was required for an emotional support animal was done away with entirely. The packet was changed to a reasonable accommodation overall. It includes several different questions related to what type of reasonable accommodation a person is requesting. And in the question applicable to emotional support animals, all of the requirements about the animal type and how that animal type was determined was removed. And it became a general statement about the request on whether or not the person was requesting emotional support animal due to their disability. Next slide, please. And further, the third party verification requirement that the verifier be a licensed medical professional was removed. Now you may have seen in the HUD FHEO 2020 guidance that has been referenced that the third party verification requirement is about reliable third party, a person who has reliable information about a person's disability and their disability related needs. So you can see in the amended signature page that a lot of the information became voluntary or only if applicable as it relates to a person's title or their agency or clinic name. Now, I will recognize that in the conciliation process, we did compromise on the concept under the, that the signature be under the signs and pains of penalties of perjury. Uh, it is not my preferred statement on a reasonable accommodation form. In this context, uh, we understand that that statement is typically meant to be a chilling effect um, or to dissuade third party verifiers from signing. And so given that we had removed the licensing requirement uh, and removed the other chilling effect language that on its own, it was acceptable in this context uh, to remain that language in this form. Now, I have been purposefully describing to you this young woman's emotional support dog as a 50 pound pit bull. Now, remember that my hearing aid squeal and dog bark. A dog's behavior is not based on their breed, but is based on their human handler. And I say this as a person who has been traumatically attacked by a pit bull mix. And so I myself may not prefer pit bulls, but I fully recognize and advocate on behalf of individuals who have a pit bull as their emotional support dog. So let me show you what the young woman's 50 pound pit bull looks like. Next slide, please. Now, I will share that I was required to change out the photo of her actual dog to a stock photo. And if anybody wants a timeline cleanser, you're free to email me and I will provide a photo of her dog who looks remarkably like this dog. And so the presence of her dog, the pit bull itself was not a direct threat or a danger to the community. It's the behavior of whether that dog commits a dangerous act. Next slide. So my time is limited, but I wanna go through one more fact pattern. And what I want to discuss is the mental health on university students and the mental health impact that COVID-19 has had. So the mental health of college students who are young adults have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The brutal combination of relocating from their childhood home to launch as an adult into virtual learning in their dormitories has resulted in widespread isolation. So these young adults are being removed from their childhood homes or families into strange environments to become adults and then not able to socialize and meet others, whether it's through class or after school activities uh, because of the isolation and the quarantining brought by virtual learning and COVID-19 
And so oftentimes we hear landlords or college students or young adults argue that the tenant is simply trying to bring their childhood pet into the property. So remember, again, there's a differentiation in young adults with mental health disabilities and without. And so an emotional support animal is an assistive device that is an extension of the disabled person and they're not a pet. And so for a young adult or a college age student with a animal that they are bringing from their household home, their mental health is such that removing themselves from that animal will impact their ability to function and to be successful uh, in the adulthood that they are now engaging in. Next slide, please. So to quantify this, we have seen the impact on the mental health of students in our own complaints. Uh, I would refer you to two different studies that have been done. So recognize, as Sarah said, that dormitories and any university operated housing are absolutely applicable to the Fair Housing Act. There was a study done of University of Pittsburgh students in which 1,200 students were tracked and it was ob observed that 36% increase for students who were at risk of clinical depression when it was compared from spring 2020 when the pandemic started to the impact of the pandemic a year later in spring 2021. Similarly, uh, in North Carolina, a research study was done of over 400 first year students, so we're talking about the ages of 18 and 20, and they were tracked in the first few months of the pandemic. And they observed a 40% increase in anxiety, a 48 increase in depression, and the depression particularly was higher for black women and LGBTQ plus students. And so not only are students at risk for increased mental health symptoms, but students of multiple protected classes of multiple identities are at a higher risk of an emotional support animal making a substantial impact in navigating their new adulthood and navigating the pandemic and their first adult housing of their life. Next slide, please. So at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, FHP reached out and we engaged because we saw that we could change their emotional support animal policy. And what you'll see here is that the emotional support animal policy applies to all, that we created with the University of Pittsburgh, applies to all four of its campuses. What we had previously noticed was that the policies for disability related requests uh, differed from campus to campus. And so in that collaboration and effort, we made sure that the policy was consistent across all of the housing that the university operated. And it also made sure to identify the student's rights and responsibilities as an animal owner. And so the person with the disability, the emotional support animal is an extension. When it comes to health and safety, as you understand that, if there is county or local law regarding licensing and shot, particularly as it pertains to dogs, uh, then certainly that information can be required and provided to the housing provider to ensure a safe environment. But it can't be assumed that the presence of the animal without other governing laws that dictate a health and safety requirement causes or will cause a health or safety uh, impact. And so what I wanna bring your attention to is that what we were successful with the University of Pittsburgh was addressing their third party verification requirement. And so the university requires third party verification from a healthcare provider or a reliable third party who has personal knowledge of the student's disability. And this is described in HUD's FHEO 2020 guidance. And the University of Pittsburgh uh, policy provides links and provides direct reference to the fact of what it is that we are asking by making sure that emotional support animals are available to students who can't access traditional mental health services. Consider a young adult who has used their high school guidance counselor for support during high school, or they've used a coach at an after-school activity or event, or perhaps a young adult who has aged out of foster care and they have a case manager through social services, or perhaps they're from a household where they had difficulties with the household functioning and the household itself receives social services. And so the, the allowance within the 1988 legislative history that made definitions of disability broad and applicable to 
not requiring verification from licensed healthcare providers is critical, not only in terms of making sure that we have access to housing, but making sure that university students and young adults have the emotional support they need to function independently and to be successful from the get-go as they pursue the first housing that is their own as an adult. Next slide, please. And so this is the signature page, page of the University of Pittsburgh's Emotional Support Animal Policy. Uh, the link is provided as well if you want to review the whole policy itself. Uh, and you can see that we maintain the language regarding uh, that the qualifier can provide their qualifications, how they know of or interact with or their relationship with the student, but only if applicable as it pertains to a license or to certification or degree. It's not required. And so what I want to say is that we as a country are addressing the ongoing impact of COVID-19. And in fair housing, emotional support animals, while we are overwhelmed with the requests, they are critical for disabled individuals to require that assisted device, particularly as we are dealing with the impact of COVID-19 that is heightening and worsening mental health symptoms nationwide. And so we as FIPS and FAPS and HUD are tasked to ensure housing choice and access for young adults with mental health symptoms who are launching into their first adult housing during a worldwide pandemic while navigating their needs as a person with a mental health disability. We already have the law and it's over 30 years old. And now it's time for us to do the work. Uh, thank you all for taking your time out of today. And I'll turn it back over to Kishana. Thanks so much, Megan. And thanks to all of our panelists um, for your very insightful presentation. So we are going to jump right into the Q&A because there are so many questions. And um, I want to be clear that we are only um, able to answer questions today about assistance animals and reasonable accommodations related to assistance animals. There are a few questions that have been submitted that are just about reasonable accommodations in general or specific kinds of accommodations that don't have anything to do with animals. And so we won't be answering those questions. Now, I wanted to start with a question um, that's a little bit different than the others. We have plenty of questions with specific examples and people wanting to know, well, can a landlord do this? Can a landlord say this? Can a landlord require that? So we'll get to all of those questions. But I'd like to first pose to the panel a question about the Section 8 voucher program. The question is whether, if anyone knows, um, in the Housing Choice Voucher Program, can expenses related to the maintenance and health care of an assistance animal be considered medical deductions that might lower the cost of one's rent? Does anyone on the panel have experience with that issue or question? I'll uh, take a stab at it. Um, it's been a long time since I've looked at the guidance that was issued by HUD's Office of Public and Indian Housing, but I do seem to recall that um, in some guidance that I saw in the late 1990s or early 2000s, the issue of disability-related expenses was addressed. And so I don't know if uh, folks are aware of it, but uh, in the context of federal income tax, people who have service animals typically can uh, deduct the care and maintenance costs for their service animal as a healthcare expense. So I would definitely say that there is a parallel argument that could be made in the context of the Section 8 program. Sorry, but I don't know today whether the example still remains in the guidance, but it's certainly an area I could follow up on and provide an answer to. Thank you, Janine. Um, so we will move on. And one um, group of questions that we got, because several attendees have asked uh, the same questions. And so one group of questions that we got is around vaccinations 
I would say in general, there's a theme with some of the questions people are wondering what landlords can require or ask for. And I think it's important to say, um, all of our panelists said this to, to some extent, you know, that in having this conversation, you all are presenting the information about how landlords can ensure that people with disabilities have access to housing. And some of the questions really um, seem to be seeking to determine the ways that landlords can limit some access. Um, and so a lot of the questions may follow that theme. One group of questions uh, is around whether landlords can require vaccines, you know, including rabies shots, things like that. Can they require that um, people with disabilities submit their animals to DNA and feces testing? Can they require licensing? Um, are these things, I guess, legitimate asks on the part of the housing providers? I'd love to hear what Janine has to say about those questions. I'm happy to talk about them. Yeah. So um, under all of the disability rights statutes that I discussed, there is the obligation of the person with a disability who owns a service animal or owns an assistance animal to um, maintain the animal in a healthy state. So um, from that perspective, I would say if there are state or local requirements for animals to have um, vaccines, the, um, the person hasn't complied with their end of the bargain if they have not uh, complied with those legal requirements. That said, those legal requirements aren't honestly for the landlord to enforce. Those legal requirements are for animal control to enforce. Um, so, uh, you know, then I'm gonna tell you the practical answer. Um, if there actually is a vaccine that an animal can have to provide protection from rabies or distemper or whatever the other condition is, um, why the heck not have that vaccination for your animal? Um, most communities offer free services uh, through their animal control or their humane society for individuals to get vaccinations for their animals if they can't afford them. It's either free or low cost. Um, and uh, it certainly makes sense to protect uh, the individual with a disability themselves and their animal. The rabies vaccine is actually protection for your dog more than it is protection for people your dog may bite. Just a practical answer. I just want to add one point to that. I, uh, if a landlord took adverse action against a tenant because they didn't have their dog vaccinated yet or something, I, I as their lawyer, would want to know how the heck the landlord had authority to do that under their lease. And I would ask that question. And I, I, sometimes this becomes a matter of control, not a matter of goodwill concern at all. And um, uh, I, I would I would argue that I agree with Janine about the vaccinations and all of that, but a landlord that just wants to jump in and take adverse action without giving a warning or offering to help or something like that, I think is doing more about controlling than they are um, serving correctly uh, a, per, a person with a disability who needs the reasonable accommodation. I would start wondering about, uh, the, there were a bunch of questions about poop patrols and DNA testing of poop and, and all of that. And I'm just gonna say, really people, get a life. You know, if there's an issue about poop, there's some discussion about having appropriate areas for the animal to talk, to keep their, uh, to have their dog uh, be walked. And that might not be unreasonable in the circumstances, but you know what? Yes, sometimes people don't pick up after their dogs. And yes, sometimes that's because of their disability but a landlord can require maintenance people and other people to do this cleanup job. And when it gets down to taking adverse action against someone about where their dog poops or doesn't poop, 
or whether uh, whether whose dog's poop is there, I just have to say they need to get a life and find someone who works for the property to do the cleanup. Um, this is this is a this is one of those things where it just seems a little bit out of control. Is what I want to say. And I'll just add with respect to the DNA testing for dog poop, that is awfully expensive. That would be an inappropriate term or condition to have someone be required to pay for the DNA testing of their dog's poop. If a landlord really thinks it's that important, they can pay the fee themselves. I would simply jump in to add is that we had a case in recent years where the policy as a pet policy that applied to the emotional support and service animals uh, required that dogs be debarked, cats be dehowled, and all animals be declawed. And so to Sarah's point about control is that when the policies are being applied as a means of controlling the animal or the disabled person uh, is to really evaluate the point of the policy and what the property is trying to accomplish. I can certainly understand as a tenant myself, uh, the need to hold people accountable amongst the community for who is picking up after their dog. But charging a disabled individual additional funds for having a disability that requires an animal uh, is, is simply not allowable. And so as you consider the policies, consider the intent and make sure that the intent is to provide a health and safety environment uh, that is not imposing additional requirements uh, on disabled people who require an animal. Thank you, Megan. Um, so I hope that we are done discussing the bodily functions of animals. And so we will move on to a different set of topics, something related to requirements around the animals. Um, does a property manager or landlord have the right to require that the, emo that the assistance animal be kenneled or kept in a cage when the owner is away from home? No. Thank you for a, <laughs> a quick answer. We can keep, keep rolling through uh, these. So the next question is whether someone with a disability can have their existing pet um, trained uh, to become a service animal. So if someone already has an, uh, an animal that may be a pet, can they train that to become an assistance animal or would they have to go and get a whole new animal to provide that function? And then generally speaking, is there financial assistance for this kind of training? So there are a lot of people who train their own service animals that's uh, particularly true of uh, deaf people who work with an animal to train it, to alert them to uh, people and sounds. I know uh, in uh, a blind man who trained his own guide dog after he had used a guide dog trained by a school, he decided he wanted to pick out his own dog and train it. There's no requirement that you obtain the dog from a third party, and there's no requirement that the dog not have a past as a pet. Thank you. And so along the same lines, I just, uh, it sounds, I think this is a, a question that's related. And I think the answer is no, but I just want to make sure, Janine, that I'm clear. Does the training given to the animal then have to be from someone with specific knowledge or expertise? No, uh, the training is just uh, training that is provided to the individual animal and the training that's required for a service animal under the Americans with Disabilities Act is only training that um, the animal respond in a certain way in a given situation. Uh, a lot of people can train their own animals to do these types of things, but the question really is, what is the disability related need for the worker test that's performed? Mm -hmm. And there's case law that says, it says clearly that a person with a disability can in fact train their own dog or other animal 
And so these requirements that animals to get cert certificates from a specialized training would be an unlawful condition on a request for reasonable accommodation. There is a Department of Justice guidance on service animals that makes these points clear. Great, thank you. Um, I There was another question, um, again, related to the kinds of things that landlords may lawfully ask about or require. Um, may landlords require that um, people with disabilities get insurance or have insurance that covers actions taken by their animal? Uh, HUD has dealt with that issue in the past. That would be an inappropriate condition to place on a reasonable accommodation because an assistance animal is granted as a reasonable accommodation. There was a case that HUD addressed years ago in the context of uh, an assisted living facility where a person used an electric scooter and the housing provider wanted to insist that anyone using an electric scooter had to have an insurance policy because they might accidentally run someone over uh, and there were other frail people living in the facility. Uh, that case actually went before an administrative law judge and the determination was no, you can't require insurance for an assistive aid of that type. So I'll refer you to Megan's idea that an assistance animal is an assistive aid. Thanks. Did anyone else have anything to add on that? Simply uh, that added and required insurance uh, is a, a cost because of having a disability. Uh, and so adding a cost of an insurance uh, that's required due to uh, a disability related device, which would be an emotional support animal or a service animal uh, is often a discriminatory term and discriminatory. Uh, requirement. Okay. So I agree with that and also agree that um, insurance in a variety of other settings, requiring insurance in a variety of other settings is an unlawful condition on a reasonable accommodation. Just what Megan said, because it would cost, there would be an additional cost associated with it. I've seen it come up in many kinds of cases, not just service animal or assistance animal cases. So, and, and to, sorry, Sarah. Yeah. To return to the concept of, of the training, and, and I agree with what Janine said, and often what the questions are trying to get at is an animal misbehaving in a situation. And for those of us who remember the ADA 2010 revisions, uh, and as Sarah pointed out about pythons, there was a lightning rod case of a boa constrictor or a python brought into a McDonald's and that the abuse of bringing an animal of any type and size and the behavior of that animal in that setting to the surrounding environment was causing problems in the public areas and on airplanes in recent years. And so as we're talking about housing, the consideration is that I'm responsible for my hearing aids functioning correctly. A wheelchair is user is responsible not to damage a door with that wheelchair. But a malfunction can happen and an error can occur, at which point it must be corrected when that happens. But to assume that the animal will misbehave before it is present or before it does a misbehavior uh, is a discriminatory determination. I have denied a case in which a housing provider was requiring an individual to remove their emotional support dog. He could have a different emotional support dog, but that dog uh, had bitten another dog at the dog park down the road recently, and it had been substantiated with the police report. And so there needs to either be taken actions that addresses the animal's behavior or removes that animal because of a specific act. Thanks, Megan. So we'll, we'll come back to that um, theme, but um, another uh, group of questions has continued to come up around um, allergies. And the question is whether um, a housing provider can disallow 
um, a request to have an assistance animal as a reasonable accommodation because of the allergies or fear of neighbors or people that live in close proximity to where the animal would live. And if we could address allergies and fears separately, and Megan, I did hear you discuss the idea of fear of neighbors earlier in your presentation, but if we could answer the question as to whether allergies or fears of a certain type of animal um, make it permissible for a housing provider to disallow a request for an assistance animal, that would be great. Thank you. Should I take I'll, a first stab or do you want to? Sarah or Megan? I think go ahead. First stab, go right ahead. All right. So uh, when I was at the Justice Department enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act, one of the cases I had was an allergist who refused to allow a person with a service animal to come into the office because many of the uh, doctor's patients uh, were allergic to dogs. Um, that case was resolved with the allergist being required to allow patients with service animals to come into the office. They could have a procedure that ensured that the people with the dogs were separated from the uh, people with dog allergies, but the procedure had to be non-discriminatory. It couldn't treat the person with a disability worse than the person with the allergy, which in most instances does not rise to a level of a disability, although there are some instances where a person has asthma and it does. So fear, uh, similarly, um, you can have a person with a disability where they have a phobia that makes them uh, terribly afraid of dogs. Typically, what you need to do is accommodate both of the individuals. So you might uh, reach some agreements on how the people interact with each other when they happen to be in the same place. But you don't say no uh, service or assistance animals because of allergies or no service or assistance animals because of fear. HUD has actually dealt with a case where a housing provider tried to keep a person with uh, an assistance animal from using the elevator together with the app with the animal or tried to make the person use the um, use the back door where trash receptacles are kept to take the animal outside and that has been found to be a discriminatory condition. So I'm going to be supportive of all of those comments. I, I think they're all well taken. The other thing I will say is sometimes stories make the rounds and it's like somebody is talking about them everywhere. But I have yet to see a real case involving evidence that someone had a service animal that had that created a allergy, in fact, for someone that was in close enough contact with them to make a difference. I've never seen that case. It's a lot of hypothetical stuff, but it's not real. And so the things I would say about this is to identify a little strong, bigger take on what Janine said, is to first identify that there is in fact an allergy as opposed to a hypothetical allergy, and then look for an interactive process that would essentially uh, accommodate both people's disabilities if both people actually have a disability. It just takes some thought and some listening and some uh, possibly some accommodation. But I think Janine's point is sometimes there's not two people with separate disabilities that come into conflict, although the landlords kind of see it that way, but it's not really because one of them may not actually have a disability. And secondly, even if both have a disability and both need an accommodation, for me, that's exactly when an interactive process should occur. You don't take adverse action against anyone who is exercising their fair housing rights. You try to find a, work, a workaround, basically, a way to work it out. There's actually case law on the topic too, in the context of a sorority at a state university in Ohio. Uh, the ADA coordinator was found to make the wrong decision when he wouldn't allow a person with an assistance animal to move into a sorority where a current resident said she had an allergy to dogs. And um, the judge uh, 
ruled that the ADA coordinator, first of all, should not have accepted the assertion of allergy without actually confirming that there was an allergy, et cetera. And let me simply add uh, is that disability and equity is about facts, not conjecture. So for example, my actual hearing loss is progressive. I've been losing hearing since the age of five. And theoretically, I could wake up tomorrow with none of my residual hearing remaining. But I don't live my life that tomorrow that would happen. If it happens, I will address it. And so when we're discussing hypotheticals and what ifs, remember that a reasonable accommodation requires the disabled person to make the request. And so the hypotheticals of how it will impact other tenants does not go beyond the health and safety and behavior of that specific animal. The landlord or housing provider is only obligated to respond to the disabilities of other tenants that conflict with the existence of an animal when that tenant makes a reasonable accommodation request that the presence of the animal is negatively impacting their disability. And so oftentimes it helps in fair housing because it's all about critical thinking. We don't have a flow chart that says, if this, then that. The very nature of it is a case by case basis. And so when we look at that and understand that an emotional support animal that is impacting another tenant, that that tenant absolutely has to make that request and show and prove that their disability is being impacted um, by the presence of that animal. Thanks, Megan. Um, it, it reminders that we have to stick to the facts um, are, I think, incredibly important and helpful um, as we move through these conversations. Um, so another group of question deals with restrictions on where um, assistance animals may live. We heard earlier that a landlord may not require that an assistance animal be caged or kenneled when the owner isn't home. Um, but what about a requirement that an, uh, an assistance animal live exclusively indoors? Would that kind of restriction be permissible under the Fair Housing Act? And then um, additionally, a requirement that, for instance, and indoor outdoor emotional support cat be on a leash anytime it's outdoors. Are these kinds of restrictions allowable in your view? So I think the answer to that one is it sounds like a particularly fact specific situation. Um, so I would want to know if I was presented with this type of a situation what would be the need for the animal to be indoor, outdoor? Um, could the individual with disability, uh, act, do they actually have the physical capacity to use a leash on the animal? Is the animal the type of animal that typically is leashed? Um, you know, I don't see too many guinea pigs walking around on leashes. So uh, a leash is typically for your dog. It's typically not for your cat. Having tried to walk a cat on a leash in the past, I can tell you that that's true. Um, so I really think it's a, a, a specific situation that requires analysis. I can tell you that I recently heard about um, a circumstance of a resident in a Southern state that had an indoor outdoor cat that provided emotional therapeutic support to him, he was a quadriplegic and um, uh, enabling the cat to go in and out uh, of the window, assisted with some of the uh, hygiene control issues for him of having this animal. He lived alone, he was independent because of that. Of course, he lived in a condominium association where neighbors were very offended that the cat didn't have a leash. I think that'd be a very interesting case to come to HUD. I'd certainly want to see that analyzed in terms of the specific facts at issue. What's the benefit that the animal gives and what's the harm that it causes? So I agree with that and would add that a lot of the restrictions on the animal themselves read to me like conditions that could be unlawful because they're so restrictive. And before placing those kinds of restrictions, like you must have your dog when you leave the house, really? 
I mean, when, when you start looking at those situations, uh, you begin to wonder if there's just not, again, uh, too much effort to, to have uh, control over the animals and condition the actual accommodation as a result. Uh, it's the same thing, Janine's point about the uh, using the, the uh, service elevator to take your dog in and out of. I, I remember that case, Janine. And we had the same view. I mean, it's, it's, it's treating the person who has an assistance animal or service animal adversely and negatively simply because they, uh, they, are, they are having that accommodation offered to them. And I think landlords should be very careful about um, putting too many restrictions on uh, the animal, whatever the animal is, uh, in terms of um, conduct or whether they're in or out or anything else, because it can read very much as a restriction on the accommodation itself. And returning to the point about the behavior of the animal is that if the animal's in a common area and under the control of the owner. And so when you talk about conflicting disabilities, for example, uh, an individual with autism could struggle mightily with the dog jumping up on him and the sensory overload. And so the dog being leashed, the cat being in a carrier, uh, a guinea pig being in a carrier, or any other functionality in which the animal is under the control of the individual. I had a case at a public housing authority where it was a senior citizen high rise, and the requirement was meant to ensure that the animals were under the tenant's control in the lobby. But what the rule actually was, was that all animals had to be leashed or in a carrier. And a woman with a small emotional support dog uh, used a walker. And so she was unable to have him in a carrier. The dog wasn't allowed to walk in the common area. Uh, the dog had to be confined in a carrier or carried through the lobby. And so she was unable to use her walker with both hands and hold her dog as well. And so then when she showed, and it was readily apparent that she could not comply with this rule, they suggested that she get a wagon and scoot the wagon behind her uh, instead of allowing, and this was all to prevent the dog's paws from touching the ground. And so she eventually sent us a picture where she effectively took bungee cords and bungeed the dog to her walker. So that way she could focus on solely pushing her walker uh, and not having the dog on the floor. So the engagement with the housing authority was again explaining what is the purpose of the rule? And it is absolutely reasonable that she is in control of her dog by leashing it and walking the dog across the lobby. And so again, go back to the point of the rule and the policy and what its outcome, uh, instead of trying to be overly restrictive and controlling of the behaviors. So I wanted to weigh in and say that is really an excellent point, talking about having control over the animal. But I would also like to provide some perspective. In the context of reasonable accommodations, housing providers can have the obligation to do many, many types of things. This is one of the less onerous types of things that housing providers might be asked to do. Animals are very common in housing. Um, so, you know, in the context of a service animal, uh, they have to allow them in ambulances, they have to allow them in intensive care units of hospitals, uh, they have to allow them in zoos, um, amusement parks, all different types of places where you normally don't see an animal. Under the Fair Housing Act, we're talking about allowing animals to be in a place where animals often are. It's just that in the individual instance, the housing provider prefers to have a rule that prohibits them or restricts them. And that's okay, so long as the only thing they're prohibiting or restricting is a pet, not an assistance in. Thanks so much, Janine, for that um, final bit of insight. And with that, we are going to have to close out today's discussion. It has been a pleasure to have you all with us today. And thank you so much 
for sharing your insight and your expertise with us today. Um, based on the number of questions, this is certainly a conversation that should continue going forward. One final reminder to today's attendees that you can find all of the slides presented today, as well as you'll be able to find the recording from today's conversation on the forum page of the HUD exchange. I'll ask that you please check out the NAFTA website for a description and important information on registration for upcoming forums. Please also connect with the National Fair Housing Training Academy on LinkedIn for insights and information about upcoming events, including future conversations. Thanks to everyone who made today's event possible and a big thanks to our panelists and our interpreters. Finally, for our attendees, please be on the lookout for a survey, which will pop up when this training ends. The survey will allow you to provide feedback on today's event. Your feedback is critical to improving these forums. It won't take very long to complete the anonymous survey, and we do appreciate your input. Thank you again, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you on the next NAFTA forum. Take care.